Um, I wore a wig to school once, and they said no headgear was allowed. <laughs> um, How did the did spider they, was it tights. obvious that it was a wig? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. I was I was, was having a fun. Wig. <laughs> See, this is exactly why we have them on the show, and this is what makes them fun. You're listening to KXVS, the voice of Stockton, ninety two point one FM. This is Barbara Berrigan Perea with Delta Flows, a radio show by the voice of Stockton and Restore the Delta. This is the weekly radio show where we discuss everything Delta related, the environment, water management, water quality, farming, history and culture, public events, recreation, Delta food and the arts. Tune in to Delta Flows on KXVS, the voice of Stockton, streaming live on Facebook and YouTube at KXVS Radio. KXVS, the voice of Stockton, live. The voice of Stockton at Stone Soup Studio. KXVS.org. The views and opinions expressed in the following program do not necessarily reflect those of KXVS, the voice of Stockton, or its parents, affiliates, management, and staff. Good morning, Stocktonians, and welcome to another exciting episode of Tales and Tips. I am honored to have with me today Bruce Blodgett of the San Joaquin Farm Bureau. Before we start chatting about the Farm Bureau, I am going to give you a reminder that this Saturday, United Cerebral Palsy has their walk and their relay race at Swenson Park starting at 8 a.m. There are still Space is available for teams to sign up for the relay, and it's $500 for a team, and the walk is free. Please come out and participate, help fundraise for this important community organization. And with no further ado, let's welcome Bruce Blodgett to the show. Good morning. Good morning. Pleasure to be here. Great to have you here today. So for those of our viewers who aren't aware, please explain what the San Joaquin Farm Bureau does um, tell us a little about about farm bureaus throughout California and why you wanted to be a part of the Farm Bureau. Well, Farm Bureau started in San Joaquin County here in 1914, so a long history. And Farm Bureaus were started across the state. Uh, we were the second or third, depending on uh, which county you're arguing with, uh, county to establish a Farm Bureau. Uh, but we were established through... Uh, partly through some legislation that authorized uh, land-grant universities, and specifically in California, the University of California system, uh, to have to expand their operations so they could educate growers on proper practices, how to grow, how to produce food. Uh, to get one of those extension agents from the University of California to actually come to your county and locate in your county and do field trials and do all of those things to improve your agriculture locally, you had to establish a Farm Bureau. So again, we were the second or third uh, in the state that, uh, that moved forward with that. We still have somebody of cooperative extension attends every one of our board meetings. We've still maintained awesome. that relationship. Wonderful. Yeah, and it's, it's, we've grown as an organization since then. Um, you get a group of growers in a room and they all of a sudden are, are talking or discussing or complaining or, or uh, and it didn't matter back in 1914 or today in our boardrooms, there's always something uh, that needs to be addressed. And so it's Farm Bureau has become more of an advocacy organization and uh, we also do a lot of training programs and education wonderful and earlier you were telling me that there are a couple counties in California that don't have farm bureaus which I, I was surprised but it makes sense that ours was formed so early on because agriculture is such a big part of our county absolutely one of the top agricultural states in the in the nation for that matter uh, it's interesting when we go uh, sometimes to the American Farm Bureau, and we've been recognized for some different programs that we've done by the American Farm Bureau, and we're asked to come back and talk about them at the American Farm Bureau Convention. You'd be talking to a grower from another state, Iowa or wherever, and uh, they would they would say, tell us about your agriculture industry. We'd talk about the diversity of crops, cherries, almonds, walnuts, dairy, wine grapes, you name it, um, used to be asparagus. Uh, you talk, we talked about all that, and then we say, you know, close to a $3 billion industry, and I had more than one person stop me and say, you made a mistake, you said billion. I said, it's no mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, that's more than their, yeah, that's mm -hmm. sometimes more than entire states produce. Mm -hmm. It's huge. And we've had discussions before about asparagus and how it's gone down from 60,000 acres to now less than 2,000 acres, um, and it's changed a lot. 
Um, what crops would you say have replaced the asparagus? What's come in instead? You know, it's funny. I was just at uh, Victoria Island Farms on Friday. It was a big asparagus growing and packing mm -hmm. operation. They planted almonds. They also had blueberries. Uh, the okay. blueberries were a natural extension of the uh, asparagus originally. They could go from asparagus season into into the blueberry harvest. Um, so they, they've changed significantly. They have some exciting things coming on that uh, I think it's going to be worth watching as they they're want to do a, make a dis, or build a distillery out there on the property, oh, Re, wow. repurpose the buildings and okay. you know grow the barley and the and the the grains locally and and produce uh, produce spirits here in the Delta and I think that's going to awesome. be exciting. Yeah, it was uh, first chance I had to go talk to the folks out there and really excited about the prospects for that. Very excellent. Wow, that that's amazing to hear that. Um, Talk about water and farming and talk about drip irrigation versus flood and rotating crops versus trees. <laughs> uh, where do you want to start there? Drip irrigation versus flood irrigation just depends on what you're growing. Mm -hmm. There's certain commodities that uh, lend themselves better to drip irrigation and specifically the, those, uh, those tree crops and those, those orchards, those orchards and vineyards are a lot more efficient and, and run a lot better on drip irrigation and are use water a lot more efficiently on drip irrigation. So anytime you see new orchards and vineyards, it's, if they're not in immediately, it's, it's just a matter of time before they, that they convert to drip. Uh, when you start talking about the row crops and crop rotation, that has some certain benefits, but a lot of that is flood irrigated. So your water usage is actually pretty significant there, when you, especially if you're, if you're trying to pull on a couple crops. Now, sometimes Mother Nature helps you out a little bit in that process. Uh, I think as you've seen in the last, you know, ex with the exception of last year, we've been in some pretty significant drought cycles here. Mm -hmm. So a lot more water had to be applied. Uh, one of the ironies is a lot of people generally look at drip irrigation versus flood and say, well, we should do as much, we should do more uh, drip irrigation. One of the impacts that we've seen, and you know, one of the consequences of that, is it's affecting our water tables. Uh, when you're not flood air, get, using flood irrigation, you're not applying that amount of water to the ground. That's that was helping recharge your basins. So mm -hmm. even that makes though not sense. All, yeah, not not all of it was used by the crop, it was still helping our groundwater table. So you know, it's there's a knee jerk reaction to say either drip is good or that's the only way to go or drip or in flood irrigation is bad. It's not always been the case. It's actually flood irrigation helped us maintain our water tables. Okay. What else can we do with water? I know you talked about that drip is more water conservative. What else can we do in our county to help with water? I know that we're looking at below ground storage, above ground storage, water recycling. All, all the above. I, you know, we need... Um, we did see some movement finally on, on a site's reservoir, uh, which is something that's positive. If, if we're going to have these cycles, and we keep seeing news reports that we're going to continue to have these cycles of, of massive rain events in years of drought, and massive rain events followed mm -hmm. by massive rain events, uh, we do not have the capacity to capture those, those rain events uh, to currently. So we do need to put some more storage. Uh, some of that can be above ground, some of that can be below ground, but uh, there seem to be uh, the state seems to be creating more obstacles and opportunities there, and I think that's something that needs to change. Um, so obviously supply, uh, whatever we can do to bring more surface water into the county and utilize it will take the pressure off the groundwater. And of actually, course. so that's an opportunity. The other thing is, and, and we've been talking about it for years with, with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, uh, which is now going to affect the county and the residents of this county significantly uh, moving forward. The, um, the original debate had a discussion on can we use surface water, uh, high flowing surface water. In other words, when we're in those flood cycles, when we're in those high water, when we're trying to pull water, can we use that to recharge our basins? And the legislature blew it. They uh, didn't complete that argument. They didn't complete that discussion. And they left us with a, a hole. They left us with a, the one solution that we can do, that we have to really improve our groundwater is to find more surface water. Mm -hmm and the legislature legislature punted on it susan eggman's been carrying a bill the last couple of years she can't get it through the system um i think the mistake that they made the folks that were in the legislature back then is they thought they could come back and do it later legislature's not letting them do it they don't think it's a problem you know, and it's it's almost as if they're they're opposed to solutions wow and that's unfortunate to hear especially with the resurgence of the twin tunnels um i was saddened to see her here as i'm sure you were that the Santa Clara area has added in six, $600 million to the project. They're gonna get a water storage facility. 
to me, I'm I'm hugely concerned that it's going to destroy the water and salinate our water as oh, well. Yeah. And they've acknowledged it. If if the tunnels were ever built, uh, that you could likely see uh, saltwater intrusion all the way to Sacramento, uh, which you know you're not talking about just a few acres of agricultural mm-hmm. land there. An extremely valuable resource for our county. We have the most agricultural land at stake. Mm-hmm. Uh, San Joaquin County does in the Delta. Uh, but Sacramento County, obviously very important, and, and our neighboring counties. And our, we have a, a Delta Farm Bureau caucus that meets on a regular basis, and we're deeply concerned, and we're going to keep fighting this thing and keep battling against this thing. And even with Santa Clara's minimal commitment, and I, I'm going to be blunt, minimal it's commitment. It's minimal compared to what L.A. Well, compared uh, to what the actual cost yeah. of projects can yes. turn out to be. Yeah, and it's, yes. it's absolutely ridiculous. I think $16 you know, billion is the last figure that I heard. Yeah, but that's not half. I mean, this is those are state estimates, and when is the state ever estimated right on a public works project? They've never been close. Um, Bay Bridge is a good example. It was triple, basically, the budget. So I think that's a pretty good <laughs> place to start is triple, and it's probably more than that. So it could be that. three times that yeah. amount? Yeah. Wow. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Wow. And the other thing, I, you know, I think we're going to start talking to some folks south, south of the Delta to say this is an urban project. This is only going to help an urban population. We need projects for agriculture. Mm-hmm. The Twin Tunnels are not those. Mm-mm. So we're going to at least try to have those discussions. We're, we're united as a Delta Caucus against the tunnels. Good. Um, horrible project and horrible precedent to turn your water supply keys over to Metropolitan Water District. Just and terrible precedent. And there's no new water. And there's no new water. Well, that's the biggest it's thing. It's just transporting water. No, it's just it's taking water from somebody else. And uh, that, the, that the governor wants to do that is no surprise because he's, he's been – advocating for this for years um, but hopefully some cooler heads prevail in the in the next administration so. so how can any of our listeners help in the fight against the tunnels by all means be engaged with their members of the legislature both uh, congressionally and, uh, and and locally uh local assembly local senate so jim cooper uh, susan eggman um, Heath Flora on the assembly side, athlete, obviously Kathleen Galjani. We need we need that. You know, some some have been more active than others. We we need them to continue to speak out and be really aggressive on this. Now, all of them have signed a letter uh, in an opposition to both. Uh, and I did have, we did just see a copy of a letter uh, to the governor and his uh, resources secretary saying this is the wrong option. But they're going to need to continue to be aggressive on that. Well, and I was hoping at the debates, that was the question that I was waiting to hear when the people that are running to be our next governor, what their viewpoints are on the tunnels. And unfortunately, they didn't ask that question. Right. And well, maybe in a future debate, that is a possibility. And and it's a, hopefully we can get you know the fly on the wall and there's somebody to whisper in somebody's ear to ask that question. Definitely. I mean, it, to me, that that's a huge consideration in who we select for that office. Absolutely. And it, it just scares me that something can be in the works that's going to be so destructive for such a huge part of our state. And it's really, to me, just just done. And I don't know, it seems like there's so much force behind it. Oh, yeah, they're just deeming an area expendable. And it's, you know, I hate to say it, but just to expand the housing opportunities in Southern California, this is not worth tearing up another part of the state. Well, in Southern California, is in a desert. Mm-hmm. Um, how? What is your perspective on desalinization and whether that's practical? I know there are plants already in in Southern California. Israel and other countries use it mm-hmm. routinely. No, there's there's great opportunities uh, for for desal in Southern Cal, and there's, you know, it's just a matter of we're focused so much time and effort and unfortunately resources the governor has on just one project and that's the tunnels well two that and the train uh, so we have two projects that he's focusing all the budget considerations for where we could be seeing projects move forward to augment water supplies and help people immediately uh, there are projects proposed for the for the delta that could have helped in terms of delivering more water but also improving water quality not interested in it at this point so again hopefully wow. the next governor will be at least uh, someone we can talk to about that and what are the possibilities of trying to work within our own county to fight for more water to come to our area from higher up yeah no we we will continue to do that with but with the water districts our local uh, elected officials any opportunities that present themselves we need to be we need to be fighting for water uh, we have water districts that can't use their water rights now uh, north san joaquin's an example of that that they don't have the facilities in place so they've been trying to get some funding to to improve facilities so they can actually exercise part of their water right before they lose it so 
we need we do have some water rights that are not being utilized that we need to utilize to a greater extent here and then we need to like you said need to be when as we see more storage come online we need to be looking for opportunities to expand that definitely definitely um one thing that you and i talked about that i didn't necessarily think was a farm bureau issue because i don't see it as a, a crop issue is landfills mm -hmm. Ta let's talk about <laughs> landfills and how that fits in with the farm bureau and concern with our landfills food safety uh regulations have changed dramatically uh, that's one of the major focal points when you start talking about landfills. The, the trucks that come in and are, are not, not all that trash is making it in on site. That ending up in the field is something that could affect the uh, affect ability of the growers locally to harvest their commodities. Definitely, that makes sense. You have foreign material that's now in, in you know, getting distributed, unfortunately. So some of the companies do a really good job of, of tarping off those trucks and covering those trucks. Not all of them do, unfortunately. Um, so we see some major impacts. When you start talking about expansion, the only, the only place they're expanding is onto agricultural resources. And we unfortunately have one landfill in particular that's poorly located at its proximity to the Stockton Airport and, and some tremendous farm ground that make it just a horrible place to, to continue to expand. Mm -hmm. um, that should be, you know, that's a facility they should be looking to, to wind down and close down here in the not too distant future, but they, they continue to make advances to the Board of Supervisors of how can we get the next expansion and that always comes to at the expense of agriculture and you, I know you mentioned about trucks tarping off when they're transporting but you also mentioned to me that the actual site sometimes trash and other waste products yeah. can blow off of the site as well they're pretty they're pretty good about taking care of that um, the, the bigger issue uh, that they've had to deal with and, and bring things in relative to birds attraction to birds and mm -hmm. what that does next to an airport obviously mm -hmm. so they're trying to mitigate for that but you know the right now under the airport land use plan I think they have some real issues i think you need four out of five county supervisors to approve an expansion at this point and uh, we're hopeful that that doesn't occur what are the regulations with trucks and transporting and tarps are those required or mm -hmm. are they just recommended it's required it's required okay. just again some are better doing it than others so well and and i think that's the reality with everything but if it's required then potentially those companies could be cited right um, and such just to help to protect the farmers and the land. Um, earlier, you and I were also talking about quarries. Um, before, and Before we leave, the, okay. the, the, the other thing is that we're, the majority of the trash that's coming into the land, especially that landfill, is from out of the county. We're becoming the dumping ground really? for every it's, Yeah, most of it's from Bay Area. And we're becoming the dumping ground for somebody else. And I think when we, when we have these discussion on landfills is why are we agreeing to be the dumping ground for somebody else why are we taking on that hit and i think we really need to have our supervisors asking is that the future of san joaquin county to be the dump for the rest of the we work, shouldn't the be. state exactly and that's you know that's the point that we like to make is that no we we should have a better vision for this county than we're going to be your dumping ground so. and i'm glad that you brought that up yeah. so it sounds like they're having shortage of of landfills as well right. do we and you may not know the answer to this, but do we charge the same fee for mm -hmm. someone within our county as without? Because mm -hmm. that's to me, the first thing that I, I would look at doing is charging a higher fee for someone that's coming from out of the area to try and reduce or mitigate the amount from out of the area. Right, there has uh, been some discussion of that, but nothing has come to fruition. So, okay, no. all right. And do you have a sense of the number of landfills just not only in our county, but in other counties? Ooh. Uh, <laughs> and you don't, that's okay. No, I, we have a, three in the county that I'm aware of. We have a transfer station. Um, I know of one in Sacramento County because I can see it from my uh, the ranch I grew up on. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't have a complete number of Okay, that's okay. Yeah. Um, but that's interesting. Mm. I, I was not aware that other areas are, are dumping here. Um, that's unfortunate to hear that, but that I think there's the potential to change that. Um, so let's talk about quarries yeah. um, and where they're located, why they're important, um, what can be done with the land after granite is taken out and such. Well, yeah, we, it's an issue that we continue to follow because it always, you know, if a new quarry is proposed for uh, you know, if they propose a new quarry in our county, it's on agricultural resources, obviously. And you try to look at quality of soils and the ability to, you know, what what the uh, capability is for that soil to grow. And if you have a lot of granite, it's pretty tough to grow. 
obviously. So you, you tend to try to make judgments in terms of, okay, that's a better place for a quarry than others. But we haven't had any new quarries in some time. Uh, we have some existing quarries that have been expanded. Mm -hmm. uh, we certainly uh, understand we need to get resources locally and we need to be able to source for ourselves, Definitely. not be relying on others. Uh, but at the same time, we want to see some of those original commitments. A lot of those quarries were established with an understanding that they were going to be returned to an agricultural uh, property afterwards. And we're certainly uh, wondering if that's going to indeed be the case, especially depending on how deep you go. If you continue to adjust the permit and take it deeper and deeper and you run below the water table, you just, you know, now you're creating a lake rather than a, yes. a farmable property. And that's, uh, you know, we want to see those original commitments upheld. Well, and what's so amazing about that is if you started out with land that has a huge percentage of granite, obviously you can't farm on it, but you're getting a win-win benefit because you're getting the materials out of the ground and mm -hmm. now potentially it could be farmed. That's awesome. Right. Right. Absolutely. That's awesome. So where are our current quarries located? Uh, east side of the county. Uh, if you look kind of spotted up east side of the county. So if you're looking from Linden to, up to the county line on, uh, on on that trajectory, if you will. And then uh, obviously down, you can see them down in the Tracy area. Okay. And earlier we were talking about the history of the Farm Bureaus throughout California and within our county, but we really didn't talk about you and how you decided to be part of the Farm Bureau and kind of your background in agriculture and what what makes you want to be part of the Farm Bureau? I grew up on a family farm and ranch in Sacramento County, also had property in the Delta uh, in Sutter Island, also still own a family owns a cattle ranch up in Amador County. So grew up in agriculture, was always around agriculture, working in agriculture, driving tractor, pruning Christmas trees, uh, feeding the cattle, doing whatever I needed to do uh, while I wasn't in school or in college. Uh, when I graduated from college, looked around, did a couple different things, and um, lo and behold, there was an ad in the Ag Alert newspaper, which is the, paper, the weekly paper that goes out to all the Farm Bureau members. A buddy of mine picked, saw the ad and handed it to me and says, what, the San Joaquin Farm Bureau is looking to hire someone. Well, I'm in agriculture, mm -hmm. so I had to send him a writing sample, and they asked me to come in and interview a couple of weeks after that, and offer me the job the next day. So that was 1991. Wow! So, the next uh, day. The next day. Yeah. That's awesome. And I had a, ironically, I had a, a golf game set up with the administrator, the head of the California Farm Bureau, uh, not the president side, the head staff person of the California Farm Bureau, to talk to him about opportunities with the California Farm Bureau, and. Uh, it was pretty funny. I get up there, I kept screaming down to Stockton, accept the job from Bob Cabral, <laughs> who was the uh, who was later elected Board of Supervisors, actually, and the Cabral Ag Center is named after him, and took the job from Bob and uh, took off, made it up just barely in time for the tea time. And George, <laughs> George Gomes, the individual, starts talking to me. He says, oh, tell me something about yourself. I said, well, as of about an hour ago, I'm now the program director. So... <laughs> That worked out well. They came and hired me, uh, took me up to Sacramento about two and a half years later, about three years later. Awesome. So I went to work for there for about 12 years, and then I've been back here since 2005 as the executive director. So, awesome. Yeah. And if you had to pick three highlights during the time that you've been in the Farm Bureau, what, what would Ooh. you pick? Three highlights. Um, that's really interesting. I uh, had a chance to work with some landowners down in Santa Barbara County when I was with the State, State Farm Bureau. And we worked with a variety of interest groups um, to hold a congressional hearing, or a, actually a Department of Interior hearing, on a proposal to create a Gaviota National Seashore. And um, that proposal would have taken private ranch lands and um, basically converted them to a park. And what we found is that the, the, the folks, like Nature Conservative, were less concerned about those lands becoming part of a government agency than they were they just wanted them preserved mm -hmm. and what we ended up and what the the end of that story ended up being that the department of interior released a, a you know the, their findings and one of the findings was there are ways to preserve land but simply making it a park and getting rid of the farmers is not the best option we should be looking to what, get you know find incentives to keep the farmers on the ground rather than uh rather than uh, uh kicking them off and um, given some of the history of the park service and some of their management decisions that they're making I think that was a really good decision uh, we've had a similarly uh, another park in in the Point Reyes National Seashore where they proposed expansion and we mm -hmm. were able to to say no the history there has been absolutely miserable from the agricultural standpoint 
the irony in they gave us a tour of the facilities and tour of the farms and the farmers that were there that to talk to us about how much they love the park were all outside the park and, and so one of them had champagne cellars and was growing wine grapes for champagne and we had to ask the park service would you be able to do this in the park well no and you see now there's <laughs> there's actually a lawsuit by environmental groups to get rid of the agriculture on on the parkland to re greatly reduce it and that wasn't the original commitment was made wow. so when you see those kind of situations again i think when you have a federal ownership of a private property a uh, former private property and you're just a leaseholder the top the clock is ticking whether you're still in agricultural operation. So those are a couple of the things that we worked on. Um, Delta Protection Act. Uh, I was here at the County Farm Bureau office in, in Senator Pat Johnston and a whole host of people. So I, as a matter of fact, I have one of the signed posters in my office of the Delta Protection Act from some real reservations. Um, but the, the good senator from this area was willing to work with us uh, to make sure the representation would be positive from an agricultural standpoint and that the, the there would be balance on that Delta Protection Commission. And I don't think we have one regret that they're in existence. And actually, they've been a big, big advocate as far as Delta Tunnels mm -hmm. and a whole host of other issues. Yes. So it's turned out to be something we thought could have been damaging. It's been one of the best things that's ever happened. So awesome. That's, so that's really three. positive. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, I know you and I have discussed the concern for marijuana coming <laughs> to the county. Um, the fact that it's here, um, the fact that there is legislation that's going to be voted on in November. Um, give, give us your perspective or the Farm Bureau's pers perspective. Take it slow. Uh, a lot of counties in the jurisdiction have jumped at this thing and, have, and just created a multitude of problems for themselves. Calaveras County was in, now they're out. Mm -hmm. Now the people that were in and, that, and paid the county a great deal of money are suing them for t putting them out of business. So. Um, what they found in Calaveras, and again, this is a cautionary tale, I guess, when they improved legal production, the number, number of illegal grows grew exponentially. They went from, you know, roughly they estimated 1,000 to 2,000 over 4,000 illegal grows. That's huge. And uh, the number of legal grows didn't even match the former number of illegal grows. So the... Um, there are people willing to do this and do this uh, and, and follow the rules. But what we find is when you create these areas, it's, I hate to say it, it's, it's foreign countries, uh, drug cartels that are coming in and establishing growing operations. And it's a lot of violent crime, a lot of people getting killed, a lot of people getting shot. And uh, so we want to make sure that if this county takes that step, we take it slowly, uh, that we take it very surely and understanding that we have the resources to address it. Um, that's that's the biggest thing is we need to have the resources and then you have the you know you're gonna have the potential here to have a real big issue uh, depending on outdoor grows are you gonna be able to grow outdoors and then grow hemp because you can't have the two mix mm -hmm. and so you know hemp is another potential opportunity for growers out there I think probably if you were to poll our group most of them wouldn't want either one mm -hmm. but if there was a preference it'd be the hemp of course side. Yes. Um, so I think when you're, I think you're going to have to limit the outdoor growing to hemp. Obviously, at, at some point, I don't think outdoor growing, of recreational mm -hmm. or medical, is something that's it's just going to work. work well. Yeah. Well, and I know that some of the other farmers are concerned about the effect of marijuana on their crops if mm -hmm. there's an outdoor grow. I know there's also concern about banking. California yeah. is actually working on setting up a separate banking system just for marijuana growers right I, I don't see how as a, a a current agricultural operation you get into this business uh just because you can't lose your bank i mean that's that's the only thing that's keep you know get or you your going. land i mean you right. could lose everything yeah you could lose everything so that's where i, th I think when you, people try to talk about what the opportunities are for agriculture right now because it is illegal federally until that changes, it's the, the limitations far exceed the really, the, I think, the opportunities for standard agricultural operations. For some other folks, they may be willing to take on that risk and lose their bank. For the farmers that we have in this county, they can't afford to. Well, and it doesn't make sense. I mean, especially if you're established for X number of years as, right. as a farmer, it just, it wouldn't make sense. Right, right. All right, what are some other issues that are facing our county? Well, we hit the major one with Delta Tunnels, water and, in 
just that is such a huge issue and it takes so much time for so many different groups and people. So that's something that we're all following. Just the ongoing, um, we do a number of training programs and I can run through a couple things. And just as an example, we're doing CPR training this Thursday. Uh, that's, that's awesome. Both, yeah, both English and Spanish. Every, if you're in a remote, if you're in a remote area, which our agriculturals are, you need to have one person for every 20 employees out trained in CPR. So we do that. We provide that training. It does, there is a cost. It's basically a pass-through cost of what the the entity or agency costs or charges us. It's um, forty bucks a member, but we do it in both English and Spanish. So we're Wonderful. doing that Thursday. Uh, heat illness prevention. We're doing a program on heat illness program again, both in English and Spanish on Wednesday, May twenty third. Uh, extremely important. Uh, we don't want to see family members. We don't want to see our our, our our family that is our farm workers anybody get harmed no. uh, when the temperatures rise. Heat so exhaustion is a big concern. It's, a, it's always been a big issue. There's always somebody every year that has a su significant episode somewhere in the valley. So, you know, whatever we can do to continue to educate our employees and our and our families uh, that this is something that is important. Hazard materials hauling, some of the things that we do, some of the chemicals, you, you, you need to be prepared and you need to know and understand how to do that properly. So we're providing that training. Awesome. Uh, that's also at no charge. So we're doing that both. That's on May 24th. That's in Spanish uh, from 9 to noon and 1 to 4 in English. Uh, so that's another one. The other thing that we hear a lot about is crime in our rural areas. And so we're going to do a rural crime seminar. Nationwide Insurance is going to talk to the group about what they're seeing, what their trends are, what they what they notice is happening out there. The San Joaquin County uh, Sheriff's Department, the Rural Crimes Unit, will mm -hmm. be out. And they'll be talking awesome. about uh, some of the things that are available there. And then we have Century Surveillance, who's done a lot of work with a lot of our farm businesses in terms of putting in cameras. Uh, so one of the, the local company that's a member is going to talk about what th some of the tools they have. The Sheriff's Department is, has an interesting presentation this year, and it's we've always had something called an owner applied number for agricultural operations where you can get your equipment stamped. Mm -hmm. And that's a nationwide system where mm -hmm. they can, if, if when they find that stamp, they can come in and actually you will have the opportunity to get your, your, your uh, farm equipment back if, if you've stamped it. Uh, there's a new technology called smart water uh, that just takes a small application of, of this water product. That's it's a DNA based system that will be, one for every operation. So even our San Joaquin Farm Bureau office, we've joking around that we have our uh, cow that we use for demonstrations. We're, <laughs> oh yes, we're gonna I've put seen some, that yeah, cow. It's pretty put, amazing. Yeah, we're gonna put Natalie, put some on Natalie the cow too. <laughs> uh, but you put this uh, smart water on your tools, your equipment, all of these things. A couple things can happen. If you put it in an area where the, uh, the person who's going to steal it may t make contact with it, they're gonna if they go in they get caught that night they're going to glow mm -hmm. uh, that, and they'll have the lights in to do that so it's, it's a deterrent for the for the people that are stealing stuff because they don't want to be arrested go in and they're glowing because mm -hmm. you have just a lot more evidence right there mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is they can come in and take a sample of that uh, spot where the uh, smart water is and all they have is a, a UV light that they can find it a special light and they go in They'll take a little sample of that, and they'll be able to return that piece of equipment right to your operation. That's so, amazing. Yes. That's awesome. So, um, Pat yeah. Withrow was on here yesterday, mm -hmm. and he talked about wanting to increase the number of vehicles that were out patrolling. Um, and maybe we discussed maybe even using STARS and having kind of a neighborhood watch as much as possible. We want to be careful well. with STARS, obviously, with volunteers not putting mm -hmm. them in harm's way. But, yeah, no, the more cars out there, we've, we've seen mm -hmm. some increase in the rural crimes unit and that's something that's been extremely positive and we we need to see that continue to grow going back to these mm -hmm. classes and we should have mentioned this to begin with where is your office oh. located how do they sign up for the classes are they on your website let's give kind of your contact information yes, all of the above uh we're San Joaquin Farm Bureau office is located here in Stockton so right off of Highway 99 in Cherokee we're we're right across the street from Stockton Honda Yamaha so people, I think, have seen that uh, probably if they've been up and down 99 a few times. So we're right off that Cherokee exit on Adart Road, and that's 3290 North Adart Road. They can call the office if they have any questions or need directions or anything else. The office number is 931-4931, and uh, they can get more information on any of those programs. So. Awesome. And did you want to just repeat the dates of sure. the programs and the fees? I know you said there is a fee for the CPR, right. but the other two, there's no charge. Is sure. that correct? Sure. CPR first aid training, 
May 17th, there is a charge, $40 a person if you're a Farm Bureau member, 50 if you're not. Uh, classes on that one are filling up quickly. Eight o'clock uh, is the English class and one o'clock is the Spanish class. The heating illness prevention, Nationwide Insurance is helping us out with that one. Uh, there is no charge, uh, $10 for non-members. And uh, nine o'clock is the English and 1030 is the Spanish class. The hazardous materials hauling, uh, nine to noon Spanish, one to four is English. Again, no charge to Farm Bureau members. And May 24th for that one. The it's May heat, 24th. The heat one is May, May 23rd. 23rd. And then May 31st uh, is the, the Rural Crime Seminar. So, awesome. Yeah. Excellent. And any last comments that you'd like to make as we're winding down? Just a couple. We have our annual meeting coming up. It's going to be a fun event out at Gill Lake. So this is our annual Farm Bureau membership meeting, and guests are welcome. It's only $35 a person. We're going to have a barbecue out on a ranch. We got the permits for the county to go out to a ranch and just do a barbecue out there. It's going to be tremendous. Uh, again, $35 per person. Uh, Gill Lake, call the office 931-4931 for tickets, sponsors, uh, sponsorship opportunities, um, all of the above. We, it's it's going to be a good event out there. Awesome. And then one other, your Young Farmers and Ranchers is doing their annual fundraiser Saturday, July 7th at uh, the Clinker Brick Winery. So that one is $30 per person and uh, there's sponsorship opportunities there as well. And that's an area, I'm glad you mentioned that, that we didn't touch on. How are we as a county helping to promote agriculture so that the youth wants to be farmers or participate in agriculture? Well, luckily, we've had a very successful Young Farmers and Ranchers program. We've had a number of people that have come through. Uh, that is one way to do it, is to try to get those FFA kids uh, when mm -hmm. they get through college and 4-H kids when they get out of college to come in and do something else. And Young Farmers and Ranchers mm -hmm. has been bridging that gap. And they've they've been doing a good job of purchasing animals at the mm -hmm. fairs and providing scholarship to youth. So the, some, of these, some of these kids are going to benefit at one point or another because of the involvement of Farm Bureau and Young Farmers and Ranchers. So they, they're more inclined to, if they come back to the area and working in the area that, hey, I remember wife and her. They gave me a scholarship and, or they bought my animal at the fair along with the Farm Bureau. So that's one thing that they can do. We do have a, a group that meets. Uh, typically, they meet the first Wednesday of every month. It's 18 to 35. Anybody young out there that's just even interested in agriculture uh, wants to come out, again, call the office, 931-4931. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you being here today. This was extremely informative. I hope our, our viewers all learned something. There's so much going on with our county. We are such an agricultural hub, and it's so important. I really appreciate you being here. Thank Pre you so much. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. All right. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and sign off. I am the Voice of Stockton. You are the Voice of Stockton. We are the Voice of Stockton. Let's make it a great day.